Okay, uh, on this very stage, Preston Manning said, Canada is the only country in the world that owes its foundation, its very existence, to the undue exploitation of a rodent. <laughs> That's probably true, but not as dignified as I might have hoped, so we have asked the world's foremost scholar and scientist and investigator into the Beaver Francis Backhouse to come out here and tell us more about this noble creature. So, uh, beavers. Um, when I first started working on this book, I was actually sometimes reluctant to tell people what I was actually writing about. Uh, not because of that other meaning of the word beaver, I got used to the jokes, um, <laughs> but because I was afraid that maybe beavers were kind of boring, at least to anyone other than binocular-toting naturalist geeks like me. Uh, I'm happy to say that by the time I finished working on the book, uh, all those doubts were gone. I was a true beaver believer. The, the be I, I went searching in, in search of can Castor canadensis, and I found what I came to think of as the mighty beaver, um, an incredible animal that has had a profound effect on this continent for one million years and still has a lot to offer us, which it makes it sobering to think that we actually almost annihilated this species. However, for a long time, we didn't really realize how much we stood to lose. Uh, as a society, we were suffering from a bad case of ecological amnesia. Not just, uh, you don't know what you've got till it's gone, we had forgotten what we had and why beavers matter. So, I'm going to go back and start with the before picture. In 1497, when John Cabot set foot on what we now call Newfoundland, stepped ashore and kicked off the European invasion of North America. Beavers were one of the most abundant and um, most widespread animals in North America. Their range extended from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific, from just south of the Rio Grande River, all the way up to the northern tree line. With a few exceptions, wherever there was wood and water, there were beavers, which meant there were a lot of them. The most conservative estimate of the number of beavers uh, prior to Europeans coming to North America is 60 million, and the high-end estimate is 400 million. Fast forward a few centuries, and you would have been hard-pressed to find a beaver anywhere in North America. To give you a sense of uh, the scarcity, I'm going to tell you a little bit story um, about this image, uh, which is on the cover of my book. Now, some of you might recognize it as the work of the great American naturalist and wildlife artist, John James Audubon. And if you do, you might wonder why the beavers are a little odd looking. Well, in 1843, Audubon went on a journey to collect specimens and take notes for what would be his last great work, uh, a book, an illustrated book about the mammals of North America. He traveled up the Missouri River for, or spent eight months traveling up the Missouri River, 3,000 kilometers, and got most of what he was looking for, with one exception. Although he had the assistance of a skilled trapper, he failed to see a single beaver in that eight-month period, let alone catch one. And as far as I know, he never did get hold of a live beaver to use as a model for his painting. Uh, there would have been no point looking in eastern North America because by then beavers were gone from all of the eastern states, most of eastern Canada, and uh, the, the trappers were well on their way to cleaning out beavers in the western half of the continent. So, by 1900, the North American beaver population had nosedived to an all-time low. Now, we don't know exactly how many survivors there were, but the best guess is that it was in the low hundred thousands. So less than 1% of the most conservative estimate of the pre-European contact population. The scale of this slaughter came about because the fur trade was North America's first 
gold rush. And beaver pelts were the gold, literally the coin of the realm for a large part of the, the early colonial period. When Europeans arrived in North America, they, the, the hottest fashion item back, back home was hats made out of felted beaver fur. And as a result of demand for these hats, the Europeans had decimated their own beaver population. It took two to three pelts to make uh, a good quality top hat. Um, and now here they had arrived on a continent that was swarming with beavers. So the fur trade started on the East Coast and steamrolled across the continent, obliterating every beaver colony in its path. By the time we were headed into the 20th century, the general consensus was beavers were headed for extinction. So not everyone believed that. There were a few people who still held out hope for the beaver and began working to try to save the species. And one of the most famous of those people was a man uh, named Archibald Delaney who moved to Canada in 1906, changed his name to Grey Owl, and reinvented himself as an Indian. Uh, besides being a cultural imposter, he was also a serial bigamist, a negligent father, an alcoholic. <laughs> but his redeeming quality, at least in my opinion, was he was a, a great promoter of beaver conservation. And through his efforts and the efforts of less famous uh, beaver advocates, governments were convinced to implement trapping regulations and then to start reintroducing beavers to places from which they'd been exterminated. And this worked. Uh, beaver populations started to rebound. They began to spread out and reclaim their old territory. And this became uh, one of North America's greatest conservation success stories. Beavers have now come back to almost all of their historic range. Um, they're even in big cities like New York and, and here in Toronto. And um, they're, they're doing reasonably well. Um, it's hard to count beavers. The current estimate is that the population is between 10 million and 50 million. Okay, so I imagine at least one person out there is thinking 50 million beavers? That's not a success story, that's a horror story. The invasion of the dam builders. Um, and that's an understandable reaction. Uh, they're formidable adversaries when their interests are not in sync with ours. Um, when they're blocking up culverts and flooding your roads or your farm fields, when they're cutting down all the beautiful old trees in your local park, or, God forbid, fatally attacking your dog in an off-leash area, which has happened. Um, some years ago, 2011, uh, S Senator Nicole Eaton actually launched a campaign to fire the beaver as our national animal. Uh, she called beavers dentally defective rats and <laughs> toothy tyrants that wreak havoc all over the place. Um, okay, harsh words, um, but as I say, I understand uh, how that thinking comes about. Um, beavers can cut down almost any size of tree. The largest tree that's ever been found cut by a beaver was uh, about a meter in diameter. Um, they can build huge dams. The historical record comes from the journals of uh, the mapmaker David Thompson, who was traveling across the prairies in the late 1700s and found a beaver dam that was a mile long and wide enough for two horses to cross it walking side by side. So imagine that. Uh, the current record holder is only about half a mile long, but they're working on it. Um, so, yes, uh, toothy tyrants, I prefer to think of them as faunal philanthropists. And it turns out that humans are one of the major beneficiaries of their philanthropy. Um, as beaver populations come back, Biologists are finally able to really study them properly, and we're getting more and more proof that this is a species that punches well above its weight in terms of ecological impact. I'm going to talk about four ways that beavers make our world a better place. To start with, they create critical habitat for 
a multitude of species. Now, they're not intentional altruists, but by creating the habitat that they need for themselves, they increase the supply of a highly desirable and relatively rare type of natural real estate, namely wetlands. So beaver ponds and those squelchy, swampy edges around them are biodiversity hotspots that teem with life. Dragonflies, tadpoles, fish, turtles, ducks and herons and swallows, uh, mink and moose that you're going to hear about more, more about later. Um, these are entire complex communities that are contingent on the presence of one keystone species, the beaver. Second beaver benefit, erosion control. Now, when they dam rivers or creeks, they don't stop the water, but they slow it down. And this has two effects. Sediments build up behind the dam, and there's less channel scouring downstream. An example of how this can be beneficial comes from Wyoming, where beavers were introduced to a very badly erosion-damaged stream. Before they came back, the stream was carrying away 33 tons of silt a day. With the beaver dams in place, that dropped to four tons of silt a day, so a 90% decrease in the erosion. And not only were they stopping the damage from continuing, they began to heal the land. The undammed river was like a knife that was slicing down through the ground and leaving the plants on the banks high and dry. With the dams in place, the, the river channel built up, the water was elevated, and it could flow out laterally and feed the groundwater system. So there was a higher water table, more trees and shrubs, and more birds. Third thing is pollution control. Specifically, beavers excel at nitrogen busting. So all over North America, septic systems and fertilizer runoff are pumping nitrogen into creeks and rivers. That goes downstream, and it becomes particularly problematic where in coastal areas where it feeds massive algae blooms which suck up oxygen and kill off fish. Recently, a team of researchers from New York found that bacteria in the bottom of beaver ponds can remove up to 45% of the nitrogen from the pond water. So with beavers on the job, there's less nitrogen flowing downstream, and we have healthier coastal ecosystems. And lastly, Beavers are outstanding water stewards. They help mitigate against flooding and drought, which are both becoming more frequent and more severe um, in this time of climate change. So when there's heavy rainfall or rapid snow melt, beaver ponds hold the water in place. It can be released more slowly instead of flowing downstream in a, a torrent. Same thing works with drought. And some of the best evidence here comes from a study that was done in the aptly named Beaver Hills of Alberta by Glynis Hood, who was actually on the stage talking about beavers in 2011. She found that ponds that have beavers in them hold more water than ponds without beavers. An incredible nine times greater surface water area in the ponds with beavers than in the beaverless ponds. And it's not just the visible water, it's also the groundwater. So another scientist, a hydrologist named Sherry Westbrook took me out to one of her study sites and showed me where a large pond was increasing, raising the, the groundwater, the water table, for a couple of square kilometers around that pond and keeping a whole valley moist through the dry months of summer. What all this tells us is that beavers can be terrific allies. They can help us nurture biodiversity, combat erosion and pollution, and cope with some of the effects of climate change. As we're getting reacquainted with beavers, we're also learning how better to live with them, how to coexist rather than um, clashing with them. Um, I don't have time to go into all of that, but um, you can look up things like beaver deceivers, beaver bafflers, pond levelers, they're flood control devices. We can wrap uh, mat wire mesh around trees. There are ways to live with beavers. So, I began with a before picture of a continent that was filled with beavers from coast to coast. And I'm very glad that I don't have to end with an after picture of a continent littered with broken beaver dams and dried up beaver ponds, which is the way it was in 1900. We've come a long way 
um, in the last hundred or so years. In 1892, the author of the first ever book about beavers, Castrologia, uh, a man named Horace T. Martin, he was really pessimistic about the prospects of his subject. He wrote, as to the ultimate destruction of the beaver, there can be no possible question. So no pulling punches, he was convinced beavers were doomed. Here's another quote from Martin. It's kind of a rallying cry to resist the ecological amnesia that was already taking hold. So a traditional knowledge of the beaver is the birthright of every Canadian. He thought that future Canadians would only be able to learn about beavers from books like his because the animals themselves would be gone. And I think he would be delighted to know how wrong he was about that. Beavers did survive, and our knowledge of them keeps on growing. And the more we learn about them, the more obvious it is that Castor canadensis is an amazing animal that deserves our admiration, our respect, our protection. Keystone habitat creator, ecosystem engineer, water steward, climate change ally, let's hear it for the mighty beaver. Thank you. Thank you.